Now, let's get into the message. We're starting a brand new series today. Address the mess, a guide to healthy relationships. All right, let me start by asking you this question. What are the two greatest commandments in all the world? They are to love God and? Oh, we can do better than that. The two greatest commandments, love God and? Love others. others. That's exactly right. There could not be a better way for Paul to end this amazing letter. I mean, we have been in this for months. We've traveled through the first 11 chapters. We have seen some incredible doctrine, some incredible truth about God, about his amazing plan for salvation. And you know how he's gonna end this letter? With practical application for us on how we can love others. In Romans 12 through 15, we're gonna be talking about all kinds of different relationships. We're gonna be talking about relationships with each other as part of the body of Christ. We're gonna be talking about relationships with the lost world around us. We're gonna be talking about relationships with our enemies. We're gonna be talking about relationships even with the government. Now, how many of you believe that relationships can be pretty messy sometimes? Anybody think that right there? All right. Any of you got some sticky relationship issues in your life? You don't have to raise your hand, but I know that all of you probably do somewhere along the line. Here's a real question, though. How many of you, as we're already setting this up and we're talking about relationships, the first place your head went was to somebody else that really needs to be here and hear what's going to be in God's word about relationships? Anybody like that? It's amazing how quickly our minds can go to other people that we think could really benefit. But you know, the reality is we need this. I need this. The teaching that we look at in these chapters, I promise you this, it will stretch us in every facet of our being. But if we surrender our lives to God and we live the way that he wants us to, man, God will do some great things in us and through us. And that leads me to the title of our message this morning, which is simply this, reasonable service. That's the title of the message this morning, reasonable service. You know what Paul does? Paul Uh, I mean, this passage, it's not Paul, this passage calls loving others reasonable service. And Paul begins with an authoritative plea. Look at the first three words of Romans chapter 12, verse one, and I need you all to help me out. Read those out loud with me. What does it say right there? The first three words. Everybody, here we go. I beseech you. This is an authoritative plea. It's authoritative because Paul is instructing us, he's commanding us, and he's doing it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So God himself, through his word, is commanding us and instructing us to live lives of reasonable service. But it's also a plea. I beseech you. I beg you. I I plead with you. Give your lives to God. Live a life of reasonable service. That's, That's where we're going with this whole conclusion of his letter. In the Christian life, belief and behavior always go together. Now, here's what's amazing. You don't, you don't have to behave a certain way to be saved. You don't have to work for your salvation. In fact, you can't work for your salvation. It is a free gift. You put your faith and trust in Jesus by faith. That's how you're saved. You don't work for your salvation, but what do you do as a result of your salvation? You work it out. Belief and behavior go together. What we believe about God absolutely should affect how we live on a daily basis. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful that God does not leave us to guess what he wants for us. He's revealed it in his word. And these are guidelines. These are commands. These are rules that we need to follow if we're going to have healthy relationships. And if we follow these rules and if we follow these guidelines, guess what's going to be the result of that? Clear and decisive evidence that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And so as we start this and as we get into the introduction this morning, I beseech you, Not just me, but through the authority of God's word, I beseech you, surrender your lives to reasonable service. You will never regret it a day in your life. So let's dive right in and look at these two verses this morning. Number one is this, reasonable service responds to God's mercies. Reasonable service responds to God's mercies. Look back at verse one of chapter 12. This time I'm gonna ask you to read the fourth word, okay? So it says, I beseech you, 
I beseech you, therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore, you have to stop and see what it is. Oh, come on. We can do better. Whenever you see the word therefore, you have to stop and see what it is. Therefore. Therefore, That's exactly right. Therefore doesn't come out of nowhere. It has roots. It has a foundation. The life that God, that Paul is pleading with us to live is a life that is built on something. Now, this verse goes on to tell us what it's built on. All right, so follow along with me. Let's go back to verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the, everybody out loud, this next three words, by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God. Paul <laughs> sums up the entire 11 chapters that he has just so carefully laid out, presented an incredible argument about who God is and about his plan for salvation and justification and all kinds of things that we talked about. And he sums up all of it with, three, with four little words, the mercies of God. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God. How many of you are thankful for the mercies of God? How many of you are thankful that that's a plural word? It's not just singular. It is the mercies of God. Man, I, there's so many ways I could go with this. I just want to highlight a few things. Some of my favorite lessons that I've learned from the first part of this book. By the mercy of God, we obtained mercy. Remember our illustration last week at the end of the service? We were all shut up. We, God hath concluded us all in belief. We were all locked up and chained to our sin. There was nothing that we could do about it. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. There's no amount of work. There's no amount of prayer. There's no amount of sorrow. There's literally nothing that we can do to be saved. But Jesus Christ steps onto the scene and he goes to the cross and he pays for your penalty and he pays for my penalty. And as a result, when we believe in him by faith, we are saved set free. We are free from the power of sin, from the bondage of sin, from the, uh, and, and from uh, the, the power of sin in our lives. Praise God. Man, I, I, another one of my favorites, by the mercy of God, we are justified by faith. That word justified, declared righteous. It's not like you just get pardoned. It's not like he just says, okay, you don't have to pay your punishment anymore. No, we are declared righteous. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin and our brokenness. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, there is therefore now no condemnation. I love those two words. There's no condemnation. Some of you probably got up this morning and were beating yourselves up. Anybody mess up this week? I did. We all make mistakes. We're imperfect people. But there's no more condemnation. We are living under the blood and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So confess your sins. Get right. Get back up. Get back in the fight. And see yourself the way that God sees you. Man, by the mercy of God, we are new creations. Man, we saw a picture of that today. We had baptism. Baptism pictures what Christ did for us. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. When you put your faith in Jesus... We literally died. Our old man died. And we were raised, just like he rose again from the grave. We were raised to do what? To walk in newness of life. You are a brand new creation in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you that can enable you and empower you to live a successful Christian life, to be obedient to all of these guidelines and examples that God's gonna lay out for us here in Romans chapter 12. And then Romans 8, man. By the mercy of God, we are adopted into his family. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us to help us in our suffering. We know that all things will work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We know that there is, um, we, we know that if God is for us, who can be against us? We know that we aren't just conquerors. We are more than conquerors and that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Will you praise the Lord this morning for his mercy? Will you praise the Lord this morning for his mercy? God is a merciful God and he's been so merciful in our lives. So here's the practical application. 
glorify God's mercy. Glorify God's mercy. There's at least two amazing truths about the mercies of God. Mercy, what's he do? He forgives the guilty and he cares for the helpless. They're they're two different things. He forgives the guilty and he cares for the helpless. We are sinners, right? We are guilty. And what does God do with our sin? He forgives the guilt of our sin. This past Wednesday was Valentine's Day. February 14th, I hope you husbands didn't forget that day. If you did, it happened. You better do something to make it up, okay? No, anyway, Valentine's Day. On Wednesday, I do a Bible class with our seniors, or do a life application class, a life management class. And in there, I had them all write down their names on a little piece of paper. I had them all pass it in. And then we just started in one side of the room and went around. And I was like, all right, whatever name I call, you have to say something positive and encouraging about them. And all those kids were like, are you serious? I was like, yes, that's what we're doing. We're going to build each other up today. And then I also said, the other thing I want you to do is I want you to tell me something that you love about God as well. And so we started going around the room. And you know what? The first four or five students, they all said the same thing. What I love about God is that he forgives me when I mess up. How many of you say, when you think about God's love, how many of you know how broken and how, how many times we mess up repeatedly over and over and over again? He forgives. That's his mercy. But it's not just that. He also cares for us. Psalm 103 tells us that as a father pities his children, he he loves us and cares for us the same way that you as a mom, you as a dad care for your children. That's an incredible love. The Bible tells us that he knows our frame. He knows that we're but dust. He knows that we are, are, are sinful and that we can't, that we're weak. We can't do it in and of ourselves. And he loves us and he meets us there and he cares for us and he visits us in our brokenness. That's the kind of God that he is. So if we're going to glorify God's mercy, what does he want as a result of all of this? Where's this going? What do you do with God's mercy? You extend it to others. That's what we're supposed to do. The practical application of the mercy of God is it's given to us so that we can extend it and we can share it with others. Look back at the beginning of verse 1 of chapter 12. Maybe you recognize a word that I've only mentioned one time. I've skipped over it on purpose all of the other times so far this morning. But it says, I beseech you, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, this is a powerful word because in chapters 9 through 11, we've been talking about Jews and Gentiles. We've been talking about two different groups of people that were both inside the church at Rome. And last week we talked about the natural branches and how they got cut off. And then we talked about the wild branches that were getting grafted in. And now that Paul's done explaining how this all works, he's done with Jews and Gentiles. You know who he's talking to now? Brethren. Because you know what the mercy of God does? The mercy of God unites. It doesn't matter what kindred, tribe, tongue, nation, how rich, poor, what color you are. None of that matters. We are all one in Christ. We are all brethren. And you know what we do with the mercies of God? We forgive the guilty. Everybody look at the person next to you. Everybody look at the person behind you. That's going to be hard because no one's looking. (laughs) Everyone's looking at the back of somebody said that didn't make sense. Just roll with it, okay? (laughs) The point is, if you look around, everybody's imperfect, right? There's a whole lot of guilty people that are in here. There's a whole lot of people that could potentially hurt you and potentially do something wrong towards you. You know what we're supposed to do? Forgive. And you know what else? We care for the helpless. We see people the same way that God sees them. By the way, who's helpless? I'm helpless. I need a whole lot of help. I need a whole lot of mercy in my life. Glorify God's mercy. This is where he's going. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. How can we not take the mercy that's been so freely given to us and extend it to others? All right, so reasonable service responds to God's mercy. Reasonable service requires a living sacrifice. Reasonable service requires a living sacrifice. Y'all are going to have to help me read the end of verse 1 when I get there, okay? So be ready. Here we go. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, everybody out loud, 
that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's just break this down. That you present your bodies. Do you know that your physical body matters? God doesn't just want us to, to dedicate our hearts to him. He wants, he wants all of us and our bodies matter. Romans 3 taught us that our sinfulness is revealed through our bodies. In Romans chapter three, it said that our throat is an open, an open sepulcher. You know what the Bible says? That our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you know what happens when we open up our mouth and our sinfulness, what comes out? Death. And he goes on and he, he makes it very clear. Our tongues practice deceit. Our lips spread poison. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. You know, one of the biggest reasons why we have relationship issues, it's not because of things that are necessarily physically, physical harm that's done to you. It's harm that's done to you with this thing right here. It's people that talk behind your backs. It's people that, that maybe gossip or assume things that are not true about you. So much damage is done with this mouth and it's because of our sinful nature. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Our, our, our bodies matter. The, 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 the passage goes on to say that our feet are swift to shed blood. Man, how quick we are to pounce on somebody that's weak and helpless instead of pulling them up and helping them out. It says that there is no fear of God before our eyes. You know what we see in our natural condition? We see what we want, how we want it. We're willing to see whatever we need to do to go get it. There's no fear of God before our eyes in the way that we act. By the mercies of God, present your bodies. You know what God wants to do? He wants to transform everything about you. He wants when you open your mouth for your tongue to be filled with praise and thanksgiving and edification in building others up. That's how Christians are supposed to live. Hey, he wants our feet to be swift to serve one another. When you see someone weak and helpless and vulnerable, step up, go there and meet their needs and serve them. He wants our feet to be swift to share the gospel and to lift high the name of Jesus. Hey, he wants our eyes to be filled with the fear of God. And when we see broken people that are lost, and when we see people acting in a sinful way, we have a heart of compassion the same way that he does. He wants our bodies. So your bodies matter. Not only that, your body is a living sacrifice. Just let those two words sink in. There's not a whole lot I really need to say about this. He wants you to be a living sacrifice. If you want to be that new creation in Jesus, you know what has to happen? You've got to die to yourself. Yeah, our, our, our old man, <laughs> the second we believed by faith, we, we died. The penalty of sin, the bondage of sin, all of that is dead. It's in the past. We still have a sinful nature. And you know what we need to do? We need to die to ourselves daily, every day of our life. We need to take up our cross and follow Jesus. If you're going to walk in newness of life, that's what you got to do. If your tongue is going to be used for praise and edification and thanksgiving, you've got to die to yourself. Every day when, when you've been hurt, when you've been wronged, you've got to die to yourself. You've got to be a living sacrifice. You know what God wants? He wants all of you. He wants your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. He doesn't care that you came down to an altar and prayed and dedicated your life to God. If you get out of here and you just continue to talk the same way and live the same way. No, he wants every single fiber of your being. And can I tell you this morning that the invitation to die is actually an invitation to live? Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. We're broken. We're sinners. Aren't you tired of the way you've been living? Aren't you tired of feeling that hurt and that pain and that emptiness? Come to the Father and present your life and your body as a living sacrifice and let him get a hold of you and let him transform and change everything about you because isn't he wonderful? Oh, what a savior. That's our God. This is holy and acceptable. <laughs> Vicky's right. The altar has a whole lot of images that come with it. The entire Old Testament. 
You could not offer a sacrifice to God that had any spots or blemish. For instance, you couldn't offer an acceptable sacrifice to God that was your weakest animal. You can't go look at all your stuff and say, well, here, let me give this ugly guy over here to him. He's all broken and hobbling around. Let's offer him up. It's not what God says. He, he wants the best. He wants the best that you have. And you know what he's saying about your body and your life? It's holy and acceptable. Let that sink in. There is therefore now no condemnation. And when you present your life to God, he doesn't look at you as weak. He doesn't look at you as spotted. He doesn't see your blemishes. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And there's not a more perfect and acceptable sacrifice than you just saying, here I am, God. Take me and use me in any way you see fit. Oh, man. You're wondering why we only have two verses on here today. These things are jam-packed. I'm already out of breath. I'm not even, I'm only halfway through. Here's the practical application. Present your body. Present your body. God is sovereign. He could, he could force us to serve him if he wanted to. But that's not who he is. This is a free and voluntary gift. He's instructing us. He's commanding us. He's pleading with us. It's the best thing you can ever do. But at the end of the day, he's not going to make you. It's up to you. The decision is yours. Present your body freely. Offer it up. And can I tell you this morning, this is reasonable. You know what that word reasonable is? In Greek, it's logikos. And it means rational. The most rational thing in all the world you can do is to present your body to God as a living sacrifice. I love what an early first century Stoic philosopher said. He said this, if I were a nightingale, I would do what is proper to a nightingale. If I were a swan, I would do what is proper to a swan. In fact, I am a logikos, a rational being. So I must Praise God. Can I tell you this morning? You're a logikos. I'm a logikos. I am a rational being. I am created in the image and likeness of God. Look around you at the brokenness of this world and recognize your only hope is in a savior. Look around at, at even if you want to live on the fence and pursue your own way. There's not blessings there like God wants to pour out. Open up your eyes. See the magnificence and the grandeur and the greatness of God and do the most rational thing you could ever do in all of the world and present your body bodies, your life as a living sacrifice. Can I tell you this morning, this is the conclusion that Jaden Goins came to with his life. You might be wondering why I'm wearing this shirt. Tomorrow is, should be Jaden's 20th birthday. I was thinking there's a lot of vivid memories that I have about Jaden and one of them goes back to last year, his birthday. And uh, that day did not start off that good. It started off in the parking lot, and uh, my wife was pulling in, and Jaden's directing traffic, and he's waving her in. And so my wife's just like following what Jaden's doing, and she pulls right in and hits another car on her way in. So we get home at lunch, and she's trying to blame Jaden. She's like, Jaden, I was just following you, man. You're just waving me on. And I was like, you, you can't blame Jaden for that car that's already parked sitting right there in front of you. I mean, you got to understand that just doesn't make any sense right there. And so then we find out that it's Jaden's birthday. We didn't know that going into that day. And then we're mad at Joe Ash. We're like, Joe Ash, thanks for the heads up, man. Can't even tell us it's your brother's birthday today. So we had no idea. So now we're whipping up like brownies. It's the thing that we could make the fastest and we throw them in the oven. And we're like, we, we can't let this boy go without having a birthday celebration. He's away from home. So we made the brownies. We took them out of the oven. They were so hot. We stuck the candles in it and the brownies were still so hot that the wax from the bottom of the candles melted in those brownies. I'll tell you what, we sat, we laughed and had so much fun that day because there's five boys at our lunch table on any given day. And then, well, six if you count me. And then don't, <laughs> there's a lot of trash talk that happens, but don't think that uh, my wife and daughter aren't right in the middle of all of that that goes on too. So we were having fun and a good time. It's one of those memories that's gonna stick with me for forever. We got some great pictures of Jaden that day. Little did we know that less than three weeks later or just a little over three weeks later, his life would be tragically taken. His mom and dad are here today. 
families here. People are coming in. I'll say more a little, a little bit more about his, what they're doing tomorrow on his birthday at the end of the message. But his dad sent me this picture the other day. Go ahead and put that Anna up there, Anna. His dad was uh, challenging his church to live with quorum Deo, which just basically means live in the presence of God. I think, was that a theme that you had for a year or sermons? It was a theme that they had for the year. And this was the background image that was on Jaden's phone. Live in the presence of God. Jaden was a, a rational being. He looked around him at, at this world and he said, I'm going to present my life, my body as a living sacrifice. And it was a holy and acceptable sacrifice. And Jaden was a young man that was preparing for ministry. And he was going to go back home and work with his parents on the mission field. And can I tell you, that was the most rational thing that he could have done in all of his life. And you know what? One of the things that this shirt says right here is one of the things that Jaden said in a testimony that he had made at camp the summer before. And this shirt has that quote all the way around it and it says, we only live once on this earth and we can either make our lives count for Christ or we can live for ourselves and forever regret it. We only live once on this earth. We can either make our lives count for Christ or we can live for ourselves and forever regret it. You know what? I know there are some parents back there that are thankful to God that he made a decision, a rational decision to present his life as a living sacrifice. And there's no regrets. And through Jaden's life, God is still working and God is still speaking. And I pray today, why use an illustration like this? The Bible uses real life illustrations. The most rational, logical thing you can do, be reminded of the fact that we don't know when we're gonna breathe our last breath. We don't know how long Long or short life is going to be, but present your lives as a living sacrifice. Present your bodies freely to God. And last but not least, reasonable service requires a renewed mind. Let's all read verse two together out loud. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Reasonable service requires a renewed mind. I'm just getting right into all the practical applications. Here's the first one. Be not conformed. What does that verse say? Be not conformed to this world. This is a clear, consistent call that is offered all throughout scripture. You go all the way back to when God called Abraham and he said, I'm creating you to be a holy people, a people that are separate, that are set apart. We are to be in this world, but not of this world. And what does that mean? What does that ultimately mean? Does it mean that, that we shouldn't look and dress and things like that in the world? No, we are, we are worldly creatures in that sense. What it's really ultimately talking about is the world's value system and God's value systems are completely opposite. They are on a crash course. We don't live by the world's value system. We live by God's value system. Pick out any topic you want. The reason we're here, the purpose for life. How many of you agree that the world will tell you that the purpose for life is completely different than what God tells you the purpose for life is? How about sex? The world will tell you that the purpose of sex is completely different than what God's gonna tell you the purpose of that is. How about money? How about ambition? How about how to respond to your enemies? I mean, it doesn't matter what topic you're talking about. These things are polar opposite. And what you're gonna find in God's word is going to challenge the status quo in every single area. Be not conformed to this world. God has put us here so that we will stand out and so that we will be different. The word of God and the people of God powerfully interrupt and upset and challenge the status quo of this world. So be not conformed. And then what's he say next? Be transformed. The word for transformed is metamorpho, which comes from metamorphosis. And you know what that is? That's a transformation. This is the same word that Matthew and Mark both use when they talk about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Now, that was a pretty powerful moment Jesus took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he went up into a mountain, and in front of them, he literally transformed. He transformed, and he showed them his glorified body. 
And so what they were looking at was Jesus as a man, as a human, but in his glorified state and everything about him was different. And they would not fully understand this until after he died and rose again from the grave and they saw him in his glorified body. It all made sense, but it was also a picture of the transformation that happens and takes place in us. Be not transformed, but be transformed. There's a fundamental transformation of character and conduct that God wants to take place in your life. So you physically look the same, but everything about you is completely different. Especially if you got saved later in life. The person that you are transforming, the person that you are becoming, yes, you look the same, but everything about you is different and your family and your friends and people start looking at you and they're like, who are you? What happened to you? And upon further examination, you know who they see? They see Jesus. That's what should be happening in our lives. And quite frankly, who I am 10 years from now should be different than who I am today. And I pray to God, there's a clear picture of God and who he is because there's a transformation that should be taking place in our lives. So reasonable service requires a renewed mind. Be not conformed, be transformed and approve God's will. You know what the end of that verse says? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A renewed mind. Okay, this is the key to all of this. If you're going to not be conformed, if you're going to be transformed, a renewed mind is shaped and governed by the revealed will of God to us in his word. All right, there is a sovereign will of God that we will never fully understand till one day we stand in his presence. And maybe we won't all even fully understand it completely then, but there's a sovereign will of God. Like why did God allow a 19 year old young man preparing for ministry to get hit by that car that day? I don't know if we'll ever fully know that answer on this side of heaven. There's things like that that happen and take place in life. But do you know what we can know perfectly about God is his revealed will. And that revealed will is right here in this word. We don't have to get all caught up in the things that we don't know and that we don't understand about God. When we have questions, do you know what we do? We run straight to this book and we open it up. And in this book is the good and the perfect and acceptable will of God so that we know how he wants us to live and how he wants us to do. Get in his word. There's a whole lot I could say. I'm just going to close with a, an example of Matt and Delita. Matt and Delita are here today. They're here because tomorrow should be their son's 20th birthday. But he's not here because he was tragically taken by a negligent driver, and that's probably the nicest way to put it. Does God's word have things to say about how we're supposed to respond to situations like that that are happening in our life? Absolutely. And we're going to look at that even in Romans 12. There's some powerful truths and passages. And I'll tell you, I know that they don't think that they're perfect. They probably think they're far from it. But I'll tell you, I've watched them just renew their minds over and over and over again through God's word. And yeah, they're human in their flesh. And their emotions are all over. And there's anger. All, everything that you can possibly experience has been experienced. But you know what they do? They go back to God's word. They renew their minds. And they've been responding the right way. I mean, how do you respond to a situation like that? What is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? I can tell you, it's, it's what they're doing tomorrow. They've chosen to have a celebration of Jaden's life. You know what's happening tomorrow? Tomorrow, they're going to be at Covington Coffee, and they're giving away They're giving away free drinks all day. They're buying everyone that comes in there, anyone that wants a Jeremiah 33.3 or going strong. They're taking care of it. They're going to love others. You know what else they've done? They've created a track. Why did our 19-year-old son, Jaden, have to die? And in this track is Jaden's story and Jaden's testimony. You know what they're ultimately praying for? That through his death, his, li his life would continue to speak and it would point to Jesus Christ. And they're hoping that tomorrow, and I'm asking our church, I'm talking about this today so that we'll pray, number one, for them, that God would give them strength, but number two, that God would give gospel opportunities tomorrow. That they'd be able to share Jaden's story. On the back's a QR code that will take them right to a gospel presentation that Jaden himself gave when he's pointing people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is? 
to surrender to the things that we don't know and understand, to trust and believe that he'll work all things together for good and to take a tragic situation and to use it for the glory of God. That's, that's what's good and perfect and acceptable. If you don't wanna know where we're going, this is where we're going. And you know why they're able to do that in their lives? Because a long time ago, a long time ago, they got overwhelmed by the mercies of God. And they said, you know what, God, here's my life and here's my body. I'm going to surrender. I'm, I'm willing to go to a mission field. I'm going to go to Honduras. I'm willing to literally present my life and my body. And I'm willing to follow God and to take those steps. And you know what? They weren't conformed to the, they had opportunities. One of the things that I think is so powerful about their testimony is Matt worked for a guy that he got really close with. I mean, they had a super close relationship to the point that this man was offering to buy them a house if they would just stay here in the States, here in this area of Florida. And Matt said, no, that's not, that's not what my life, that's not what God's called me to do. By the mercies of God, I'm a living sacrifice. There's people in Honduras that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here I am, send me. And you know what? Every day of their lives since then, they've had to renew their mind. They've had to get into God's word. I've, we've been friends for forever since college, man. I know the ups and downs of everything that they've been through. And especially the past year of their life, unlike any other year, Renew your mind, renew your mind. Go back to God's word over and over and over again. And as a result, Christ is clearly seen and he's visible. And that's what God wants to do in every single one of us for his honor and for his glory. And you might be sitting here and you might be thinking really human, well, if I present my body like that, will God do something like take my son? Can I tell you? I don't know, but I know this. God takes Children, tragically, God takes people from cancer with the saved and the unsaved. It happens to everyone. Don't, believe, don't let Satan let that lie creep into your mind. Here's the reality. Would you rather be in the center of God's will, living a life that is fully consecrated to God when something like that happens, or live your life outside of God's will and have to try to figure out how to deal with it there? Present your bodies. It's the most rational thing that you could ever do with your life. And God gets so much glory. And there's, you recognize there's a purpose and a plan for everything that's happening and everything that's taking place.